Welcome to the Jacob Edwards Library. Thank you for coming this evening and I hope you're going to enjoy the show, which is Dale Monette, who is somebody you're probably familiar with, um, who has done extensive photography in the Quabbin area. He has a website called the NorthQuabbinPhotography.com North Quabbin and he has written a book last year which uh, we were had the pleasure of um, hosting a program around the book. So that book is available this evening if anybody is interested in having a look at it and I'm sure Dave would be happy to sign it. Uh, he also has prints of the photos that you see and anything on his website as well so that's something you could follow up with him at another point. We're delighted to welcome Dale back again this evening uh, as it's the year of the bird as designated by the Audubon Society and National Geographic. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be able to offer a program that coincides with that uh, attempt uh, at promoting people's consciousness about birds. And I know we will be surprised, as I always am, with the birds that Dale uh, will show us tonight. He is a great photographer and uh, it's just a great pleasure to see him here tonight. And I just have to give credit to my friend, Barbara Morali, who was the person who uh, actually gave us uh, the introduction and it's just something I'm really happy about. So thank you, Dale, for coming this evening. Please give Dale a Southbridge welcome. Margaret, I think this is the third program I've done down here, and the people are always great. You have a wonderful library down here, and you have a wonderful library director, and a team. Yes, yes, that's right. And the friends, we can't forget the friends. Exactly. Who are sponsoring this tonight. Um, when Margaret and I spoke back in April, she asked me if I would be willing to come down and do a show dealing with the birds. And I started birding when I was probably 12 years old. I was in the fifth grade. And the science teacher that I had at the time, he did a spring section on birds. And that just lit me right up. <laughs> and I've been birding ever since. And I worked at the Quabbin for 30 years. And I retired four years ago. And I always have had birds in my life. And so I thought about this after we had a conversation and I thought <clears throat> I'm going to share some things tonight. These are episodes that have run through me and uh, one of them is the first one I'm going to tell you about is the Eagle project at Quabbin in the 80s. Um, how many people here have, have seen bald eagles? You, 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 yeah, at the bottom. Um, Alaska or other places? There are now, I think, at last count, there was 56 or 58 um, bald eagle nests in Massachusetts as of last June. But when I started working at the Quabbin in the early 80s, there was no nesting birds in Quabbin. Uh, in the state, the last nest in Quabbin was in 1906 down on the Cape and since then well I'll, I'll tell you the story I'm gonna get, get a hold of myself here ahead of myself um, I always show this picture I change the pictures but people always say to me how how are you able to get these pictures and I don't use blinds I don't set them up um, I have a camouflage jacket that I wear and I will go in and I will sit and I will sit two hours, three hours, four hours. Sometimes I'll come out and I will have no images. And two days later, I'll go back to the same place and I'll come out with 400. I might have coyotes, um, you know, eagles, whatever, in the spring, migrating birds. So this is what I live by. And that, that is a great egret right there. So I'm going to talk about bald eagles, and um, this obviously, obviously is an adult bald eagle that flew right over my head, and I was in the right place at the right time. He was a little bit backlit, and it just lit the tail up, and uh, there you go. <clears throat> so um, some facts about bald eagles. There's two subspecies of bald eagles in the U.S. 
the southern race is smaller um, than the race we have up here in the north. Males average nine pounds and females average 11 pounds. They both look alike. You can't tell the difference between a male eagle and a female eagle unless you actually have them in your hands or if they're on the ice side by side or in a tree side by side. And the females are always larger than the males as in any bird of prey. Um, this, this, this varies. I hear all kinds of different uh, age limits on eagles, but that's basically in the ballpark of what, what, I, what I hear. They have the champion eyesight of the animal world. Um, they can see another eagle soaring two to ten miles away. Whoa. And their heron is equal to ours. Young eagles are bigger. I've seen some young eagles at Quabbin that look like, I wonder what the is is so tremendously big. But they've still got, you know, all their f feathers in their wings. They haven't quite uh, molted their first, their baby feathers. So they, they are a little bit bigger. And an eagle has more than 7,000 feathers and their bones are hollow. And that's, that's pretty good because they look like they weigh more than you know, nine pounds. They can fly 45 miles an hour and, and during migration, um, not all eagles migrate. Um, there's a pair of eagles that I watch at the Quabbin and you'll see them later on in the program here. And uh, they stay around, they stay there year round, the mm -hmm. Quabbin, and they're on the same territories. And they mate for life. And they use the same territory um, sometimes they'll use the, the same nest year after year after year. And in 1980, um, 1980, I lost my job at 10 years. I didn't know what I was going to do, and I, I it was uh, working in an industry, and I went back to school at University of Massachusetts to get a degree in wildlife biology, which I should have done when I get out of college the first time, but I mean, high school, but I did not. I went for a different degree. Anyways, this is a photograph that I took when I was at UMass, and I got involved in the program to reintroduce bald eagles to Massachusetts as a nesting species. And um, a friend of mine and I went in and we put up a blind and we were under the auspices of the Division of Fish and Wildlife because they were the ones that were doing this program. And we were just little sprouts. <laughs> so we, we got a roadkill deer from them. We dragged it out on the ice in a cove. And they, they x-rayed it so there was no lead pellets in it. And we set this blind up and we went in in the morning on a on a uh, snowmobile, we drove three miles. We got in there and we waited and we waited and we waited. And about noon, this eagle came in for, for dinner. And that's really the first decent eagle photograph I've ever took in my life. <clears throat> so, mm. the eagles were almost extinct. Um, here again, like I just said, in 1906, Pollution and human population of shorelines caused the eagles to abandon nesting altogether in Massachusetts. From 1990s to 1960s, the population dropped dramatically because of the DDT. Um, there was only 45 nesting eagle pairs in the lower 48 states in, in the 50s. Can you imagine that? Only 48 in the whole lower um, 48 states, and now we have almost 60 in Massachusetts alone. So this program, I mean, it's not just Massachusetts. At the same time, there was a program in New York, and there was also a program going on uh, up in Maine. So a lot of, a lot of states were doing these, these reintroduction programs. Bald eagles had been spotted periodically at Quabbin since 1951. So in 1978, the Division of Fish and Wildlife decided they could see if they could reinstate the bald eagle to Massachusetts as a nesting species at the Quabbin Reservoir. Why the Quabbin Reservoir? Because it was 
18 miles long. It's, there's relatively little disturbance. There's plenty of huge trees along the shore. And uh, it uh, seemed the right place. Um, it was funded by Mass Audubon and I believe it was the Bank of Boston. And they did it by a process called hacking. What is hacking? It's an English term. It means raising a bird of prey by hand and returning it to the wild, such as falconers. Eagles imprint on an area that they grow up in, like, uh, like salmon. And it was hoped that if they raise eagles in the Quabbin, takes a bald eagle five years to sexually mature and for the head and tail to turn white and to re start reproducing. And it was hoping that they would come back to the Quabbin. In 1982 was the first year that they did the program and they got two eagles that came from the Great Lakes. And there was a program and the school kids named them Betsy and Ross. For, they had a male and a female. All total there were 42 eagles brought down here and one of them died of a vitamin deficiency. So that left them with 41 birds. In 1989, two pairs successfully reared three eagle chicks, and that was the first nest in Massachusetts since 1906. And it cost the state between two and four thousand dollars per bird for the 42 birds. Now, how did the program work? Um, well, the nest, I'm get, getting ahead of myself. This is the first eagle nest at Quabbin. I took this from an airplane. Um, one nest, I found this in literature, um, 30, 30 years, the eagles used it for 30 years. It wasn't the same pair of eagles, but eagles came and went and it blew down. So the biologist down there took and put it in a truck and took it to uh, wait scale and it weighed um, 1.3 tons. Was that the tree? Yeah. 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 Was up in the tree? What's that? I thought it was up in the tree. It was in the tree, yeah. 1.3 tons? I don't know what, what I don't know what kind of tree it was in, but it the wind stor <laughs> stor the storm blew it down. So they picked it all up and you know trucked it off to have it weighed. Uh, the female does all of the arranging, the sticks, takes them about four days to build, build a nest, and the maintenance goes on all breeding season. The bald eagle builds the largest nest of any bird in North America, 13 feet wide, um, 13 feet deep, 8, eight to 9 feet wide, and it, it's it can weigh that, that heavy. <clears throat> and some eagles have used the nest that have been there 40 years. Okay, how did it work? Um, <clears throat> the, the, the biologist, most of the birds came from Canada. So the biologist, the first two, like, like I just said, came from Michigan. They flew in an aircraft and they looked for a bald eagle nest that had two birds in the nest. And um, when they found a nest with two birds, they decided they were going to take one. And this would guarantee that one bird was going to stay behind, the parents were going to take care of it, it was not going to have a sibling rivalry, and the bird that was going to come to the Quabbin was going to be taken care of by myself and the guy's name was Dave Nelson that I worked with the first year that, that we did this program. And they put one, they put one in a bag like that, and they lowered it down. And once it got down, they checked it all over. Both birds came down. They gave uh, vitamins, and they checked the birds all over for lice and fleas and everything to make sure they were healthy. And then one bird went back up in the nest to stay, and the other one was put in his own travel case 
and he was flown to the Coavin. And they came in with a, uh, a, a pontoon plane the first year they did it. And this is the what they called the Hacken Tower. And the bird was going to be uh, was going to be put up in, in the top up here. And it was a was a big cage, and it had see-through glass because they didn't want the eagles to see humans because they would imprint on humans they would know well that's where the food comes from so when they let them go the first thing they do is fly around chasing the guys fishing for, for food <laughs> <laughs> so the following years there were two three and four birds released every year and they put an addition on with four different cages So they they lived in this in this um, cage for they we got them when they were seven seven weeks old and around twelve or thirteen weeks old they would just learn to fly they didn't want to let them go too early because they they fly and they just leave the coffin and that would be it so they had to time when they were going to let them go. So the day they were going to let a day before they were going to let them go, they put a radio transmitter on them, which you can see there, looking at the tail feathers right there, and there's the beak. They've got they've got the eyes covered, and this is a radio transmitter, and they took three or four little things of circular things of thread, they sewed it on, and they used um, glue. To hold it in, and this is the this is the tail, the tail of the bird. So the bird never knew that it had that uh, transmitter on. Um, the birds were fitted with leg bands. Uh, one was one leg was state, the other leg was a silver le band. It was a federal band. So then they were put back in the cage. And this is a picture that I took looking through the, the one-way glass. Um, they really look, they really look wild, don't they? They, they were also, they also put wing markers, blue wing markers, on the wings. So when the when the birds would would fly, they could they could tell um, which the, which the, which the birds were because they had different different stripe combinations on the wings. There we go. Um, sometimes when they let the birds out, it was like watching paint dry. <laughs> they, they, would, they would sit there and nothing would happen, nothing at all. And it would, it would take, you know, maybe three hours before one would hop out, then another one would hop out, and then they might sit there, and if it was windy, they'd sit there and they'd rock back and forth in the wind and it was it was really comical I, I loved the days they let the birds go um, there was a little island about 150 yards out and there was a pair of loons that nest on that island we call it loon island and there was just one little pine tree on it at the time and it was about eight to ten feet high and some of the birds they jump out of the door and they head right for that that tree and they missed the tree and every now and then one would go right in the in the drink they had a boat and the boat would go around and pick them up and they would take them back up the ladder and put them in there and, and, let, and let them dry off <clears throat> but it was comical the transmitter worked for six months or until the feather with the transmitter attached to it fell off and this is my friend Dave that worked on the project with me uh, with the antenna the um, it just the radio transmitter just sent out a beep it wasn't it wasn't playing the greatest hits of the Eagles or something. <laughs> uh, it, it would just let out a beep and we could tell how close we were by this uh, meter on, on, on the receiver uh, Jack Swedberg who just passed away a couple months ago. He was the one that headed up this program and he he went flying in a plane one day. They lost one of the birds. The birds took right off 
so they flew and they flew and they flew and they they finally they found it in a lake up in New Hampshire so they flew every day they flew for a week and th they thought the bird was sick because it wasn't moving it was in the same location every day so they took and they hiked in I think he told me it, it was a six mile hike in to the lake from where they were and when they had to get in there they found the feather with the transmitter on it laying on the ground <laughs> <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> so uh, and this is a this is a blind that mass wildlife put on the shore now once once uh, the birds were out and about not only were those birds hanging around during the winter but also birds from maine and new hampshire were coming down they were looking for food so they had a telescope uh, in there that was really powerful and you could read the leg bands off of the birds when they came in and they landed on the ice so that was how they would keep track of the birds that stayed around um, they could tell if a bird came from Maine if a bird came from New York just by just by getting the numbers but we had to put deer carcasses out on the ice uh, to, to, to bring these birds in and w one one day we were going to do uh, a day in there reading leg bands and Fish and Wildlife didn't have any carcasses so at that time um, they were trapping otters and the biologist would analyze the stomach contents of the otters and the trappers had skinned them, off, skinned them off so all they had was just the carcasses and they were frozen so we, we had uh, a huge crate of otter carcasses so we threw otter carcasses all over the ice in front of the in front of the building, and this is a picture. This this uh, this Loon Island out there, but there's 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 20, I think there's 28 bald eagles in this picture, and you can see they're all feeding on these these carcasses. Um, it was it was quite a thing to watch. It was a little bit closer. Let's see, there's one, two, three. These are immature birds. Um, that bird is a third year bird because the head's turning white. There's four, five, six, seven, eight, full adult right there, a nine, and 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. There's 15 eagles right there in that picture. And this was before they had even found a nest in Massachusetts. These were, this was just a winter population. And one day there was a golden eagle that came in. And this is the closest I've ever been to a golden eagle in my life. These pictures are, I should say, they're, not, they're pretty rough because they were scanned. They were my 35 millimeter slides that I scanned. So that's why they're not as sharp as a tack. But this is, this I took this a couple years ago. And this is the, the pair of eagles that I spotted uh, that I mentioned are here year-round. This is one of the adults. This is in February and they're still there. You can see the snow on the nest and um, sometimes we'd see or I'd see two two birds, two nests, two birds in that nest. You, you never know when you're going to see them. There they are, right up there. This was last winter and this is their favorite place in the Quaman. I can always always plan on seeing these birds here except in the nesting season mm -hmm. when they're both <coughs> flying back and forth um, picking up mm -hmm. food now this I put this in here because this isn't the quabbin this is um, in um, Barton's Cove in the Connecticut River in, in turn just north the Turnus Falls and this is the pair that are nesting there and these birds their ancestors came from Quabbin and their ancestors came from Nova Scotia but you can see you can see these birds have have leg bands and these birds both landed on the ice it was in the end of March 
and it was terribly windy. Now, I would like a nickel to be able to hear what that was. But that's the female right there. See how larger she is? And that's the male. He's a little small, feisty guy. And uh, I can't show you the next few pitches because that is X-rated. <laughs> but that's probably what they were arguing about. You know? <laughs> uh, I'm not going to do it right now here in the open. And <laughs> so, and this is this is an adult bird at the Quabbin from two years ago. You can see the chick right there. Little beak. And this was last summer. Um, these birds are probably 12 to 14 weeks old. They were flying around, but they were not uh, leaving the trees. There's one, two, three. And a lot of people get these con confused with golden eagles and um, turkey vultures. And I want to I want to show you that the wingspan is is seven feet. Um, can you stand up and hang on to this for me? This, this, this is seven feet. So this, this is the wingspan of an eagle. Um, and people get them confused with turkey vultures. And I always used to tell the school kids, they'd say, well, how can I tell the difference between an eagle and a turkey vulture? They're big and brown. And I'd say, this is what the wings look like on a turkey vulture. An eagle soars like this, a turkey vulture is like this, and it, the, the turkey vulture, he, he, he rocks like the wind blows. But the bald eagles are big and they just, they just soar around. So that's an eagle, that's a turkey vulture. Um, you won't pass the test if you don't listen. So. <laughs> I wanted to give you all a test tonight, but Margaret said it would take too long. <laughs> and that's a juvenile bird right there. You can see he's got, got the bands right there. Man, I wouldn't want to have that bird land on my head. And if I can see the band again, size fish. Nice bass. It's like that Saturday Night Live skit. Nice bass. <laughs> Um, now, this is, we're going to go to Cape Breton Island. Um, a lot of the birds came from Bredore Lake that they use in the program. And my wife and I go up there a couple times a year. There's bald eagles everywhere. And four years ago when I retired, um, I went up there in June to see some friends and I went by myself. And one of my friends said, you need to go out and get on Donelda's Puffin tour and go to the bird islands and see the puffins mm -hmm. so I did I went down and I got on the boat and they uh, the people that own this it's out of English town Cape Breton Island and the people that own this they also own a lobster boat mm -hmm. so they came in and they jumped off the lobster boat and there was about 12 or 15 of us on the, it's a very small boat it's like a like the rear end of a school bus. And the, the woman the woman that runs it, her name is Don Elda, so she come in and I noticed she had a big bucket, big deep bucket like that. And there was about 15 fish tails sticking out of the back of the bucket. So I wondered what she was gonna do with that. So we were on our way out and all of a sudden, the, the boat slowed right down and it started gliding in the water and she said, she got on the microphone and she said, well, my babies are here, she says. And she says, uh, you'll have to excuse me. She says, just, just watch this fish. <coughs> so she opens the window and she whips the fish out. And the fish goes splat in the water. And in comes this bald eagle. And it, it, we, it was so close to us. It grabbed that fish and we could hear the smack in the water. I mean, this the, this the boat right there. This the, the railing of the boat that I where I was standing. It grabbed that fish and off it went. So I thought, hey, that's pretty good, you know. So a little while later, in comes this guy. 
<laughs> she throws the fish out. And uh, so I, I, just, I, was, I was blown away. So I was up there for a couple days and I thought, I gotta do that again. So I went back and it was the same thing. So every year, I look forward to going out there. I don't care about seeing the puffins or, 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 or the kitty wakes or, or the ox or the, the seals. I just, I can't wait for her to throw that fish out. Okay, loons, uh, common loons. Uh, the males weigh 13 to 15 pounds. Uh, the females weigh 10 pounds. The wingspan is four feet. They have webbed feet. They can't walk like a normal duck. The, 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 their legs are so far back that they just can't, they can't walk on land. And uh, the chicks hatch in the summer and they go out to sea. They don't migrate. They go off the Cape or off the coast of Maine. And it takes them two years to sexually mature. And when they show up, Sometimes they go back to the natal pond, sometimes they don't. Um, but it was hoped that they could get them to come back to Quabbin. Um, they appeared, they first appeared in 1975. And they nest right on the shore, which is not good. Um, you can see, here's a pair of wounds. See, see how far back the legs are? Mm -hmm. And these bands are put on um, by the biologist at Quabbin. And what they do is, this, this bird is named, I, I'm going to point this out, see that white strip of white on the back of his head? We, we call that, that bird whitey. Um, every week during the summer, because loons are threatened in Massachusetts, the DCR, they monitor these loons. And it was thought that they nested um, in the same location every year with the same mate and that they made it for life. And in the late 80s, they, uh, there was a gentleman in Maine discovered a way to get these bands onto the loons so we can ID them. And what they found out when they started watching that was it's a patent place out there at Quam. <laughs> <laughs> So, so they go out every every week. We go out, and when I retired, the biologist said to me, "You can't, you can't just leave us cold. You can't retire." Uh, she said, "Do you want to at least volunteer for us one day a week?" So I've been doing that since I retired from May until September, helping them with the loons, monitor the loons. I, I love these birds. So, anyways. Loons have a habit, when they preen, they wave their wing around, up their, their foot in the air. And with, with binoculars, we can see the colored, see the colored bands. And we have a database, and we, so we can tell who is what, who is where, who they nested with last year. And they have a pretty good database that they've built up. <coughs> they, they're in touch with um, people in Maine and New Hampshire. We, um, one day we found a, a loon down here that was banded in uh, 2003 up on a lake up in New Hampshire. So, but they nest on the shore. They, they don't go up in the trees, they don't go up in the woods. They just push themselves on their bellies right up and they build a, a, a berm around them, and, and they lay one or two eggs. And this, this is how they cool themselves off. So you imagine in July sitting on a nest like that with, with black feathers. But because being in a reservation, reservoir where the water goes up and the water goes down, you either get flooded out or the water goes down so fast with pushing yourself on your belly, you can't you can't get to the nest, so the eggs would die. And see, this bird's got a problem. Um, so what the DCR did in um, see in the late 80s, 87, 88, they built these rafts, 
and they they anchored them with long cables. So when the water goes up, the rafts go up. When the water goes down, the water goes down. This particular raft had a problem a couple of years ago. It was cockeyed. So the biologist told um, my partner that I do this with, and myself that we should take some styrofoam out and see if we can fix this. So we went out and there was no birds on it. They hadn't started nesting. So he put the boat right up against the, this, this, this corner was, was down underwater and we had to get a big piece of styrofoam type stuff underneath it. So I was hanging on to the, this corner with one arm and I was hanging over the front of the boat and he was to the right of me, and he was trying to lift it up and put the styrofoam underneath. And all of a sudden he said to me, hey Dale, look. So I looked up and we're both laying on our bellies and we're looking out and the, there's a loon coming right for the raft. <laughs> and the loon jumped out of the water and right up, right up, oh, like where you see, where you see it <laughs> sitting there. And it looked at us and we looked at it. And, uh, <laughs> Man, it took off like a shot. <laughs> but they don't always use them. And I always wondered why a, a loon would, you know, not use one of those things. <laughs> so I had to try it myself. And, and I didn't see any problem with it. <laughs> so. Um, the chicks, the chicks hatch in about 20, 28 days, um, and what they do, that's Whitey, that's Whitey again, he's got uh, one chick right there, and there's another chick right there, and they ride on the backs, and they cover them over with their wings, oh. Oh. like that. <laughs> I've never seen loon chicks. A loon pair with three chicks they always have one or two and the, the loon mortality is really not good at Quaggan um, they the, between the eagles and all the other predatory birds up there and then heavy rains and whatnot um, I'm not sure what the numbers were this year but I think they, they had 22 22 nesting pairs and um, I think they had 14 or 15 chicks made it to September. But this is a, they get, they grow very fast. Um, this, this probably is a week old. And that's, that's why he, and the same two chicks that were under his wing, that's a week exactly. Look how, how big they've grown. They couldn't fit under that wing now if they, you know, had to. And that's Whitey again. Um, crayfish. They they mainly um, loons are fish eaters, uh, but they love crayfish. I see them come up with crayfish quite a few times. And if I'm on the shore, sometimes I'll see a you know a loon that's got a couple of chicks, and I'll just sit there and I'll watch them. And uh, nine times out of ten, they'll come, they'll come up with a crayfish. And that's a huge sunfish. Um, my pat, my partner and I thought that that loon was probably going to choke to death, but it didn't. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, it went down. Teeth. Then I went right right back again feeding. Do they have teeth? Do they have teeth? Uh, no, they don't. They swallow that whole. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And there's 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 another one with with crawfish. <coughs> and this is. Out of all the loon pictures I've taken, I think this is my favorite loon picture. That to me, that just says everything about a loon. They're just, uh, they're just gorgeous birds. That's two for the price of one. <laughs> no, great blue herons. I love great blue herons. Um, they weigh five or six pounds. Their bones are hollow. Their wingspan is seven feet. Um, even at five pounds, they're the North American's heaviest heron. They have what you, if you've ever tried to sneak up on one, they have what they call monocular vision, which means one eye goes one way and one eye goes the other. So it's pretty hard to sneak up on them. And this past spring, I found a pair uh, about 
three miles from my house. And they, I went in and I was watching them build a nest and it started snowing. And it didn't slow them down at all. You see the male right there coming in. Um, the male always brings in, this brings the sticks in. And they do this little dance, this little ritual. Um, see their, their top knots are both, they stand right straight up. And the male, I had to laugh at the male because the male would bring the stick in and he'd turn around and he'd go right back down to a beaver lodge. And he was ripping the sticks off the top of the beaver lodge. And he was, he was coming back, coming back and giving them to her. And uh, she, would, she would take her time, you know, she just took her time building the nest up. But uh, they, they, they Greek little herons that just, they're just what kind of trees do they normally build in? Dead ones. Dead, <laughs> dead pine, pine trees. Pine dead pine. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they'll use, if the trees are oak, um, I'm not sure what kind of tree that is, but I, I think it might have been a dead, excuse me, a dead pine. This is a different pair of birds now. This is a bird um, that, that in actually in the Coahuila watershed. Um, I watched this pair two or three years in a row until I went in there one year in the spring and the wind had blown the tree down. Mm -hmm. But it was perfect. It was perfect photography for these guys. You can see these three little guys right here. Um, the adults catch fish, snakes, frogs, and th what they do is they swallow them and then they bring them up to the nest and they regurgitate them up. Um, the clacking noise that the young ones make, they, they go for the beak. This is the adult, they go for the beak. And uh, usually when they're 14, 12, 13, 14 weeks old, they, they start leaving and they leave one at a time. And if they happen to leave the nest, the adult birds will not feed them. They, they don't even go looking for them. Um, if they want to get fed, they have to go. They have to go back up to the nest. And this is one that I saw jump. And he kind of flew and fell, and he was picking around down there. But they do a lot of a lot of practice in the nest. They spear at sticks and they spear at each other, and they're they're. They, they're pretty active in the nest, so when it comes time for them to fledge, they're uh, they're out and about. Now these are just some great blue heron pictures. I love taking pictures of great blue herons. Um, people think I'm nuts, but I just love these birds. And this is what I call the stump. A lot of birds use this stump. I found this stump, and I found a place up in the woods, and I set up, and I was amazed at what went on on that stump. Um, this is my buddy, I call this guy Guac, because he, uh, herons, when they fly, they go walk, walk, and he always let me know when he was coming. And uh, he would come in, and he'd land on this thing, and he'd let out a couple of squawks, and then he'd go about fishing. And here he is, coming in. I knew he was coming, so I was ready for him. He landed there, and then he... He says, hey, what's in the refrigerator? <laughs> oh, just something little. Um, maybe I can find something bigger. Um, yeah, that's the ticket. Um, this was this year. See, the stump is, is moved. The water is so high this year that it kind of dislodged the stump. But herons have, have no class. When it when it comes to going after fish, is that the Quabbin too? Um, this is in a pond in in Peter Sam. But I'm between the otters and the herons. I'm surprised there are any fish left in this pond. And some guys like sushi with <laughs> their salad. See, just bang. <laughs> Uh, got it. And this this was in the this was in the Connecticut River a couple weeks ago. There's a power canal up there, and it's loaded with herons and great egrets. And I was standing on the road, and this watching this guy feed, and this guy wasn't a hundred feet from me. 
and all of a sudden, I, I was I wasn't. When you watch Heron, you never know when they're going to go. You can't you can't take your eye off of the eyepiece. You you've got to. If if you look at your cell phone, the minute you look at your cell phone, you'll hear a splash, and you look up, and he'll be standing there with a fish. That's rule number one for wildlife photographers. Never answer your cell phone. Never play on <laughs> Facebook. Never, never. Yeah, really. Because so many times I've got texts from people, and I, nothing has happened. And if I've had a heron or a coyote or something, I look at my to see who it was, and bang. Yeah. <laughs> so this guy went bang, and he came oh, up wow. on this this carp, and I could not believe my eyes. I didn't think he was going to eat that. I mean, you can you can see the point of his beak coming right out he speared it right through and he worked and worked and worked and it went down the hatch uh, this is a green heron they're smaller than great blue herons and they're like grease lightning when they go after fish they're tremendously fast um, and here's the stump he's got this this guy went down in there and he came up with a fish and you don't want to wave your food around when there are otters. <laughs> and then I'm standing there one day and I see this uh, adult green heron come flying across. In fact, th this picture is in my book here. Um, both of these pictures. And he landed up above me and he could care less whether I was there, and he did, he preened for 45 minutes. Wow. Her, herons, herons take forever. They preen and preen and preen and preen forever. And with that, be, I mean, he was he was zipping up every little little feather. He, he was zipping them. If you've ever seen a feather, it's like a zipper. He was pulling the zippers together, and he was going right down. It's, it's just amazed me how, how they can, you know, treat their beak with smashing it against all these fish and everything else and they, they can still do that you know um, this is a great egret and I had a lot of fun the last month and a half taking pictures of great egrets they're cousins to herons um, they weigh about three pounds they're pure white um, they have black legs they um, in breeding season they have like a fluorescent green that appears right there but in the end of july the first part of august they nest along the coast they don't nest inland and in the end of july into august the chicks have hatched and they fledged the adults have gone so everybody just kind of comes in to visit the inland and they're all over the place and there were nine of these birds um, out at the, what they call the Power Canal in Turnus Falls. Mm -hmm. And uh, here again, they just preen and preen and preen. And the, the first day I went out there, it was incredibly foggy. And I was telling uh, Margaret earlier, um, this is a great blue heron on the left and the great egret on the right. And you can, you can see the difference in, in the size of them. That these guys are, are pretty dainty compared to these guys. But not when it comes to diving for fish head first. It was really foggy the first day I was up there. And these, uh, these egrets would appear. And they would just appear out of nowhere. And they'd land. And they'd stay there for a little while. And then they'd disappear into the fog. And uh, man, I was, I was in heaven. Like I said, they just, they let it rip. But they never came up with real big ones. They, they always come up with little ones. And I never saw them come up with crayfish or anything else. It, it was always fish every time they caught them. And they, they, they would spend, I would be there, I'd get up there at 6 o'clock in the morning. And sometimes I'd stay till 11 o'clock. And these birds would still be fishing. And it's like, man, these guys are, have bottomless pits. 
And they also like salad with this and cheek. <laughs> and, and I watch this guy, and if you watch this, you can see what they do. They work them around, and then they get them so they're going in north and south, and down the hatch it goes. <laughs> And they, a couple of weeks ago, they drained the power canal. And these guys had it made because there was this one pond and these four egrets were there every morning. And it was like, like picking fish in a barrel. <laughs> <laughs> and they do have, you know, fish and right squabbles with the egrets. Uh, there's a couple pictures of sandhill cranes. They're very rare in Massachusetts, however, they nest here. There's a pair nesting out in the Berkshires out near Cummington, and I was also told there's a pair of them down near, um, I want to say Middleborough. Um, and it's just recently that they've, they've nested. Um, they would come in for a visit, and then they would take off, and then no one would ever see them again. And I happened to be going home one day, and I went by this swamp on Route 122, and I saw this bird, and it was kind of a weird-looking great blue heron. So I turned around, and I parked, and I snuck up, and I looked, and there, there was this sandhill crane. Um, big birds compared to herons. Look how big and thick and chunky they are. So they nest here and they go south? Yes, yeah. Uh, these are common regansers. I put this picture in here because these birds have lots of chicks. <laughs> chicks are right on the back. And these birds, they, they get sick of babysitting, and if there's two or three regansers in the same vicinity and they meet up, one of them might decide she's had enough of the kids and she's going to leave them with her cousin. So you, you end up with those <laughs> <laughs> this, this, you can, there's 31 there's 31 chicks there and I don't know how many different broods there are but you can see the different sizes in them um, ducks in mergansas well mergansas are ducks they do not feed young the young feed themselves so all the female has to do is just you know, swim around all day long and kind of, you know, <laughs> look over and make sure everybody's, you know, staying together. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about um, owls now. Uh, this um, this next owl is a great gray owl. It's the largest owl on the North American continent. It's very rare that they come down here, as you, as you can see in this picture. Um, here is where we are over here, and their range is up above the Great Lakes, up into the boreal areas. There, are, there's a um, species of them out in Yellowstone, but to have them over here is it's almost unheard of. When I was in UMass in the early 80s, this one appeared down in Hadley, and the word went out. And there were so many people down there they had to put an EPO out to keep people away. Uh, this guy was hanging out in a field. And uh, I, I took some pictures. This is, here again, this is a slide. The, the quality isn't really there of these slides, but you can see what this bird looks like. And I did not see another one until two years ago. A friend of mine told me there was one up near Claremont, in New Hampshire, and it was staying in an airport with a, with a river that runs right by the airport. And I went up there, and here he is. I have this picture blown up. I have an 11 by 14 picture of this in my living room. And whenever you come in the room, whenever you walk around, those eyes, they go, they go right around. And he was just ready to jump off. Um, their, their, their wingspan is close to seven feet. And there he was pouncing on a mouse, which he missed. But they're just beautiful, beautiful owls. And there were so many people up there 
the internet now that uh, I went up there a couple days in the middle of the week and there were 15 or 20 people. I never had to wonder where he was. All I had to do was find him, <laughs> <laughs> which I didn't really like, you know, but he, he didn't care. Um, on the weekends, they, they told me there was 75 or 80 people on, on, on the weekends. Um, one day I was up there, I talked to a guy from Kentucky that had flown into Logan, rented a car, and driven up there because it was a life bird for him. He'd never seen one. And yeah. he knew this bird was easy to, easy to find. And here he is. You know what he's doing here? He's watching a bald eagle cruise down the river. Yep, it was straight, and he was way up there. How he ever, how he ever found him up there, I have no idea. But he spotted him, and he kept looking and looking and looking. And there were five or six of us there. Finally, someone said, "Look, way up there, there's a bald eagle." Yeah. So he was. And then these guys, I love these guys. There's in the uh, latest issue of um, Smithsonian. There's a wonderful article about the um, snowy owls and it's pretty depressing too because um, it says that in 2000 and uh, stuff that makes you want wonder what's going on and, and two, uh, 2013 there was 200,000 pairs of snowy owls up in the north of uh, Canada or and out into Alaska. Um, last year, the survey came up with 28,000. Um, so there's, there's something really, really wrong up there. In Alaska, northern Alaska, northern most of Alaska, um, the snowy owl's top breeding grounds. In 1995, they counted 54 snowy owl nests. In 2006, there were 38. This year, there were seven, and three of those nests failed. So, you know, I, these, I, I, a lot of times I think, when I take pictures, I think like this picture right here, you know, I think, well, after reading that, in 10 years, this might be the only way you're gonna see a snowy owl is to put it up, put it up in your living room, you know? These are females. The females are every, when the food uh, is low up north, the snowy owls come down here and they call them eruptions because they come down to New England and usually what they do is they hang around Plum Island and believe it or not, they hang out in Logan Airport. Huh. Norm Smith from Mass Audubon out there, he runs the Trailside Museum, he bans them and he puts radio transmitters on him and he trans he, he caught he uh, he banded one in Boston and it ended up 7,000 miles away up in northern Canada later on in the year wow. so they this is a male uh, see this is a female see the, the, the heavy brown spots that's a female I mean that's a male they're all all white, almost pure white. Huh. And uh, she was complaining about low-income housing down here on the <laughs> island. <laughs> and this male was complaining about the neighbors. <laughs> Crow, this, there were two crows that were just driving this guy cuckoo. Any, anyone want to take a guess as what kind of owl this is? It's in a heron nest. Great, great horned owl. There were three chicks in this nest, and the third one is up in the upper left-hand side of the picture. Um, they were coming in and out the day I was in there. They certainly could fly. And this, this is a picture that I took last week, a week ago this past Monday, on Cape Breton Island in Nova Scotia, and I was in this pond. I went in early in the morning. And I see moose in there all the time. And I went in, and the sun was coming up. And I was looking out at the pond, and the sun was over on the left-hand side, and it was just coming up above the trees. And it was like a, like a furnace. It was so bright. 
and right in front of me comes this great horned owl and it, it within 20 feet of me and it was it was hunting the shoreline on the pond and it landed over to the left of me and so I immediately started taking pictures and it landed up in the tree and it said who are you <laughs> <laughs> and it sat up there for probably eight or ten minutes and it kept looking at its head kept going around it, it was so into hunting I, I don't think it even knew that I was there. And I was standing right out in the open. And finally it spotted something down the shore and it jumped off and it went down towards this rock. And it landed on, it missed whatever it was going for. It decided evidently not to go. And it landed on the rock and it turned around and it looked back at where it just came from. This is the largest owl we have in New England. Um, I forgot how tall they were, 36, 39 inches tall. Mm -hmm. They're big, uh, seven foot wingspan. Mm -hmm. This is the most common owl we have here in Massachusetts. This is the barred owl. Who cooks for you? Um, everybody has them in their backyard. At least I do. This was in my backyard. This was sitting right above my bird for you this one evening when I came out in the winter. <laughs> And this is a screech owl. Get my only picture of a screech owl looking out. Um, a lot of screech owls, they, they nest in, they, in fact, all screech owls, they nest in cavities and trees. This one nests in uh, the birdhouse. This is during migration. This is a, um, a juvenile uh, broadwing hawk. Um, this is a peregrine falcon going after these these crows. Um, this is the fastest bird in the world. And this bird landed on this rock. You can see the leg bands. I got the numbers and I sent them into Tom French, who I know. He's the head of the, um, the assistant director of Mass Wildlife. And he, he sent me back an email and told me that this bird was um, raised in Springfield. It was let go from a, one of the towers, the skyscrapers down there. And this was the first picture that had been seen. And it was, was five months old when I took this picture. In the winter, he sent me another picture of this bird. And someone had sent him a picture of it. And it was taken on one of the bridges in Boston. It was in downtown Boston hanging around a bit to eat pigeons. And then he sent me an email beginning of this summer and told me that it had mated and it was breeding out on the islands, the Boston Harbor Islands. <laughs> this is a Cooper's hawk that was sitting on the top of this rock and there were chipmunks running around in the woods and it jumped off of this rock and it started coming right at me. And I just had my camera set and nuclear speed and I turned the, sh the release on and that's the picture that I came out with. I'll, I'll never have that happen to me again. Mm -hmm. This is a red-shouldered hawk, and you can see the red. And, and he, incidentally, he's sitting right on the same tree that the green heron spent 45 minutes preening on. <laughs> same, same twig. Ospreys come through in the spring, in the fall. They do not nest at Quabbin but they do take our fish. <laughs> Some of the warblers, this is a black and white warbler. Um, this is a, what they call a yellow-throated warbler. Uh, this is a yellow, a yellow warbler. This is a prairie warbler. You can go nuts taking pictures of the warblers, just trying to get them to stay still. <laughs> And this is chestnut sided warbler. And this is my public service announcement. Um, <laughs> if you have any relatives or uh, friends that buy balloons and release balloons, um, please yep. don't do it. Tell them not to because what they do is they get hung up in trees, they end up, end up in the quabbin. And I took this picture of a bald eagle one day, a juvenile bald eagle that was all tangled up. 
in, in, in the ribbon. And then one day, uh, it also goes for fishing, monofilament <clears throat> line. If people get rats nests and they get mad and they throw it on the ground, um, this female organzer, I, I, I don't imagine she lived because her beak was all tied up in that stuff and I, there's no way I could even get close to her because she was still pretty feisty, you know. So I, 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 do, have, I do have one thing left um, and I don't know if Margaret, do you have time? Well, if you no. want to, if anybody's interested in signing a book, that's the only thing that we need to leave time okay. for. Okay, we'll end it there. So, well, I think it's a really good high note to leave the program okay. on because maybe okay. Dave will come back at another time and we can, um, <laughs> you know, leave this as a cliffhanger or whatever. Sure. Right. But, yeah. um, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Dave.